Legislative order. Committee reference in the Senate. 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour, and the member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. The Acting Prime Minister on ministerial arrangements. Uh, Mr Speaker, there are no ministerial arrangements to advise today. Uh, was not appraised of. Mr Speaker, I inform the House the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism, the Honourable John Moore, will be absent from question time today. Mr Moore is participating in the Australian Tourism Order. Exchange in Melbourne. The Minister for Science and Technology, the Honourable Peter McGoran, will answer questions in Mr Moore's absence. The questions without notice. Are there any questions to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition? Mr Speaker, my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Has the Acting Prime Minister seen reports today that the Prime Minister has likened the extremism of the member for Oxley's One Nation Party with that of the former Ku Klux Klan leader David Duke and the leader of France's far-right National Front Jean-Marie Le Pen? Isn't it a fact that neither the Klan nor the National Front have little chance of election under voting systems which apply in those countries, but that our Senate system affords minor parties a much better chance for election and influence? Accordingly, will the Prime Minister now follow up? Will the Prime Minister now follow up the Prime Minister's concern to marginalise the One Nation Party by giving a guarantee that his party will join with the Labor Party in refusing to give preferences to One Nation? and request his coalition partner to do the same. The Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to respond to the question asked by the Leader of the Opposition. I would advise him that in the recent uh, French elections, of course, Le Pen uh, grouping polled in the first round 14.9 per cent of the votes and went on in the second round uh, to, in fact, gain uh, a seat, a seat uh, but nevertheless a seat in the parliament. Pauline Hanson, one seat, Federal Parliament, Australia. Uh, I might add that uh, the state. Uh, Order. Members on my left. I might add that uh, this is an important matter. It is an extremely important matter. And, and I therefore would like to advise the House of another development this day in relation to this matter. In another place, at 12.45 this day, uh, the Leader of the Nationals in the Senate gave a very positive, powerful and persuasive speech with regard to the future and the Hanson agenda. And I commend the uh, contents of the speech because I have done it on many occasions, my friend, and uh, I'm glad the Leader of the Opposition has corrected his front bencher with regard to this matter. Uh, and in fact, uh, last year and this year, I have repeatedly said the Hanson agenda is a dumb and divisive agenda for our jobs here in Australia and boosting, boosting our trade exports. With regard, with regard to our preferences, these are matters best finalised closer to an election date. Order. The, order, the, uh, order, order. There is too much chatter across the too much chat across the benches. The Honourable Member for Fisher. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security. Is it a fact that young people are concerned that they can get more money being on the dole than they could from study or training? Minister, does the government, or how does the government's new youth allowance address this perverse disincentive against study? And what other benefits will the youth allowance have for young people? The Honourable Minister representing the Minister for Social Security. The Member for Batman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the first point that I think needs to be made, uh, particularly to those who have been uh, fairly free with their interjections, is that in Labor's last year in office, youth unemployment was a staggering 32.3 per cent. Now, now. And, uh, Order. And, and this government's on my right. and this and this government's priority is about Members to give young left. people the opportunity Member of obtaining Denison. a job, and we're making changes to the system that are designed to achieve just that. And this will be a uniform set of arrangements for all young people that involves Member the amalgamation of payments. And this is a matter that's been long called for by a large number of welfare organisations. 
and I welcome particularly the support of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, who today have said that we've been asking for better support for this group of young people for many years, and finally their needs are starting to be recognised. And it makes the further point, and I quote, homeless young people are often forced to drop out of school or training simply because financial pressures are too great. 16 and 17 year olds who come to our services uh, have to meet the same costs as other young people living independently, and the extra $12 a week are much needed. Um, and so uh, that uh, change, the amalgamation of payments, is something that has been long supported and sought. It was a matter that the former government uh, decided not to address. Uh, I don't know the reasons for that. The change, the change will mean that the majority of young people will be unaffected as a result of the change and 137,000 will be better off. The uh, proposals, the changes, remove the disincentive to study, which saw the, uh, the dollars of the unemployed. Um, well, I mean, that's what was happening in your electorate. And uh, this, change will ensure, this change will ensure that those young people will be in a position to uh, undertake studies. This is not about putting the unemployed down, it's about bringing students up. It's designed to encourage the maximum skills possible. We know that it's to encourage the maximum skills possible. The fact is that three times, uh, or young people were three times more likely to be unemployed if they left school at uh, the year 10 level than if they leave school at the year 12. And so this is about keeping them in education. It's about giving them vocational skills as well as the opportunity to study for degrees. And uh, if I can just, uh, just tell you of the, uh, of the nature of the change, 41,000 students will benefit from the abolition of the 1,000 per annum or study minimum entitlement requirement. 16,600 students will benefit from the independence criteria, which are more lenient than those which are currently apply under OS study. 19,900 former students will gain from the abolition of the education waiver period. Around 15,000 unemployed and 19,500 students, most of them under 18, who are living away from home and or are independent, will benefit from receiving an increased rate of payment. 9,300 continuing students aged 25 and over will benefit from the alignment of rates with the youth allowance. All youth allowance recipients will have access to the $500 loan advance currently available to the New Start allowance recipients. And for the first time, uh, young people will be entitled to rent assistance. And this will be up to $75 a fortnight. Um, if, uh, uh, in, well, it is true. It is true. Uh, particularly. Uh, and, uh, and around 70,000 students will benefit from the extension of rent assistance with an estimated average gain uh, of $31, $31 per fortnight. Uh, it's important for those in rural areas uh, because very often they have to, uh, they have to uh, travel away from home uh, to study and it will be very important in assisting them. These are changes that are substantially beneficial to young people Remember and are recognised as such. And that's why the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, amongst others, are applauding the government for being prepared to undertake these changes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister on the same subject. Does the Acting Prime Minister recall the Prime Minister's Fair Australia speech delivered shortly before the last election to ACOS when he said, and I quote, it is not an acceptable response to the youth unemployment crisis to tell young people to stay at school. <laughs> Yesterday, the Minister for Social Security says it was, and indeed her counterpart in this House seemed to say the same, and she said, not legitimate to aspire to be a full-time worker at 16 or 17 and that young people should be in school or training until 18. Acting Prime Minister, why did you wait for the Prime Minister to fly off to Britain before announcing the comprehensive betrayal of that commitment? Is it because over there he doesn't have to look young people in Australia in the eye? The yeah. Acting Prime Minister. Yeah. How order. insincere. That, that jibe does you little credit, Leader of the Opposition. Little credit indeed. In fact, uh, the announcement was done by my ministerial colleague, the Minister for Social Security, in conjunction with other ministers. It uh, was done with the full approval of the Prime Minister, who is involved with every aspect of that decision. And why wouldn't he be? And why wouldn't he be proud of the fact that, in fact, the announcement is actually in accord with the very quote you've uh, read from? Uh, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. 
Order. What you forget is what this coalition is doing as part of and paralleling the youth package. We're providing 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships next financial year. And so there are other alternatives there. Yes, they can go back and stay in school, or they can go out and get apprenticeships and traineeships. We are providing incentive, whereas all you provided was an encouragement to go on the dole and do nothing. The honourable member for the honourable leader of the opposition, I uh, and it goes back to the heart of that question. Oh, do you agree with the prime minister when he said it is not an acceptable response to the youth unemployment crisis to tell young people to go to stay at school? The question is in order. The acting prime minister. More alternatives than just staying at school. The honourable member for Sturt. Uh, thank order. you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Young people in my electorate of Sturt order. who leave school early are most at risk of joining the unemployment queues that are a feature of Labor's legacy. What will be the benefits of the common youth allowance a for young for people will. of school age? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Here, here. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for his question. The youth allowance is uh, another major reform that the government is putting in place to Absolutely. help young people uh, get jobs. And uh, perhaps its most important feature, which clearly the Leader of the Opposition does not appreciate, is that it gives young people a very clear message, a very positive message, that if they, if they want to go on and get jobs, they need education and training. The fact is that if you look at the 30,000, if you look at the 30,000 <coughs> hardcore unemployed young people in this country today, left as a result of your policies, 64% of that 30,000 30, unemployed young people who were shut out of the labour market left school before year 12. Left school before year 12. The, syst the, system, the, the system which the Labor Party supported gave young people the message that it was a viable and sensible alternative to education and training to go on the dole. You, 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 supported, a system, you, you supported a system which provided financial incentives for young people to leave school and go on the dole. You, you, those young people have now become have now become the most disadvantaged group in this community, and you are shutting your face. You're shutting your face against the fact that people who deal with young people all the time, like the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, know that this is a measure which is going to provide young people with opportunities that they never had under your policy. Uh, the minister will resume his place. On, on a point of order, point Mr of Speaker, order. the Minister for Schools and Vocational Training continues to defy your direction that all comments be directed through you. He is doing it now. I, I, I ask you to draw I him to order. 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 I thank the honourable member for Hotham. The minister is aware of the conventions of the House, and I invite him to address all his responses Whoa. through the chair. Mr. Speaker, the, the system supported by the Labor Party gave young people a order. very damaging message, a damaging message which the community understands and which parents understand that it was all right. It was all right to go on the dole as an alternative to school or training. It was okay to throw up school and, and it was okay to live on the dole. Now that is the message that the government is not accepting and we are giving young people a new and very clear message that what they should do to secure their own future is to get the skills, to get the training, to get the education that will actually allow them to secure the job they want. Even, even, the, even the member for Sydney admitted, admitted that the Labor Party failed those 70 per cent of young people who are, who are not going the, on to university. Has the minister concluded his answer? The minister conclude his answer? Contemptuously at the end again. The uh, honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Anyway. 
He knows he has to throw it in at the last line now. It will be a wake to him next time. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can he confirm that an unemployed young adult aged 19 and living at home in a family with a total income of $36,000 a year will lose $121.10 a fortnight under the government's youth allowance? The Honourable Speaker, Acting Prime Minister. What I advise the House is two things. Firstly, everyone on a new start allowance or sickness benefit the member for will have their payments grandfathered under the announcement. Member for Jagger, and that in respect of means tests, which is what the nub of your question is, we are in fact uh, being more generous and increasing Labor's cut off from 37,000 to 41,000 in relation to a family with one child at home. I would add one other thing. because. I am prepared to have uh, officials examine each case you might put up, because at the end of the day people are going to be far better placed under the Youth Allowance Scheme. And that is reflected in the Daily Telegraph editorial today, which has said that taxpayer-funded holidays that the young and comfortably directionless have taken between school and adulthood are now over. The Youth Allowance is, and I quote, an astute and practical recognition that the notion teenagers can drop schooling as soon as the law allows and still be confident of getting good jobs has long been discredited. I salute the Daily Telegraph editorial. It is absolutely correct in endorsing this incentive-building scheme which will help provide job opportunities for the young people of Australia. The Honourable Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Minister, what measures has the government introduced to improve quality training opportunities for young people, and what positive effect will these measures have on the employment prospects for young Australians? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Riverina for his question. The government is in the process of implementing the most extensive vocational education and training program for young Australians in this country's history. The, the, days, the, days, the, days when young people, the days when young people could easily pick up an unskilled job are gone. The structure of the economy has changed dramatically since the early 1980s. The tragedy for young Australians is that the Labor Party, in its 13 years of office, did nothing, did nothing to address the needs of these the young people. Minister will resume his, it goes uh, to relevance. The, uh, leader of the On this particular the occasion, the question that was directed at him did not invite compare and contrast or anything else that was out there in the market. It merely sought his own government's response. A response which I might say, at, at its best, merely built on what we did, and in generality cut it. I, uh, but, no, uh, no the point, the point is relevance, Mr. The, Speaker. Is, I'm listening very carefully to the ministerial response. The question revolved around oppor creating opportunities for the young, and the minister is addressing that question. Minister, Mr. Speaker, the, the government is filling the void that the Labor Party left for young students by providing young people in this country with quality training and incentives to do training instead of going on the dole. As the Deputy Prime Minister said, the government next year is funding 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships funded through the May budget. These will be apprenticeships and traineeships in industries where job growth is occurring in tourism, hospitality, finance, sport and recreation, as well as in the traditional trades. This year there will be an additional 55,000 places in TAFE as a result of the government's policies, and uh, 43,000 of these places will be funded through the Commonwealth. The Australian National Training Authority has identified over $300 million already going to TAFE, which can be the basis for providing further job growth, up to 100,000 extra places a year in TAFE. Uh, in uh, the next five years. The jobs, pathway, the jobs Pathway program is providing opportunities for schools and others in the community to, pro to provide uh, jobs for their young school leavers. For the first time, the government is putting into place programs that will provide school students 
with the opportunity to do extensive vocational education in industry endorsed courses in schools with part-time traineeships and part-time apprenticeships based in schools. How different is this, Mr Speaker, from the short-term training programs through which the Labor Party attempted to recycle young people and, and the program of support for young people on the dole, which actually encouraged them to leave school and to stay out of education and training because the financial incentives were all the other way. This government is committed to giving young Australians a positive future. The incentives are being put in place by the Common Youth Allowance and the reforms we are making to the apprenticeship and training system and to vocational education in schools will provide opportunities which they were denied under the previous government. The Honourable Member for more. Hear, hear. <laughs> Does the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs stand by his assertion that we are winning the war against drugs when experts like the police commissioners of Victoria, Western Australia and Queensland the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence, crime fighter Bob Bottom and others are saying the country is awash in heroin. Now that heroin is openly being sold at $7 a pop on the street by 12 to 14 year olds, does the minister now concede that cutbacks to customs have debilitated the fight against the importation of drugs? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Oh, that's oh, a no. Who said that? You ask him to Mr. Mr. Speaker, I demand that be withdrawn. You've got to withdraw it. Come I ask you to withdraw it. A point of order, order uh, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the House on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you may not have heard it, but uh, the uh, member for Batman accused, uh, made, an made, made an allegation about the minister of the dispatch box in respect of what is sold in, out of his shops. That is a totally offensive remark, and he should do the right thing and withdraw it. I, uh, order. In the, in the normal hubbub of uh, question time, uh, the, the Minister is right. I did not actually hear the comment, but uh, if the comment, as alleged, was made, then I ask the honourable member for Batman to withdraw. Mr. Speaker, withdraw. order. Withdraw. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Members Mr. on my right. Mr. Speaker, there was no suggestion. We are going to debate. There was no suggestion that the minister was showing him the shopping centres. We're not going if to he takes offence, then I withdraw the it. Then I the suggestion was that the reduction in expenditure on the police may result in people is withdrawing not it. Listening. I the warn the member for Batman. No. No. Well, Mr. Speaker, with respect, the minister. Point of order, Mr. Speaker, I did not hear. You may have, but I did not hear an unqualified withdrawal, which is what is required. Well, as I said earlier, there is a lot of hubbub, and the debating chamber is increasingly disorderly. I ask the honourable member for Batman to withdraw. I thank the honourable member for Batman. The Minister for Small Business uh, and Mr. Consumer Speaker, Affairs. Mr. Speaker, in regard to the uh, question that was asked by the Minister for uh, the uh, Member for Law, in regard to, uh, of course, customs, there have not been there have not been any staff cutbacks at all in the uh, border control area. Indeed, what uh, we have done is last order. year we uh, we increased the amount uh, to some 26 million dollars over four years to go towards new technology for the customs service. That equipment will go towards extra uh, equipment, backscatter X-ray, uh, CCTV, to enhance customs' role in the war against drugs. Member for Prospect. Now, Mr. Speaker, some of the uh, the benefits of that uh, new equipment is already uh, feeding through. The member may well be aware that recently a substantial seizure involving heroin, the, the street Lord. value uh, up to uh, 100 million dollars, was as a result of that new technology. Mr Speaker, it is a combined effort between the enforcement agencies in this area, combined uh, with the uh, effort and the commitment that we are uh, giving to the Customs Service. This year's budget uh, also contained measures to increase the Customs Marine Fleet. That will increase from six to eight the vessels and increase the, size of the, uh, the fleet size from 25 metres generally, a fleet designed 
in the days when uh, customs had, uh, had uh, control to the 12 nautical uh, mile limit, and customs now, of course, have control to the 200 nautical mile EEZ, uh, the new fleet, when it comes on stream, will give <coughs> customs the ability to respond with larger, more appropriate vessels to stay at uh, uh, sea longer. The new uh, Coast Watch contract, Mr. Speaker, increased the capacity of flight surveillance uh, last year by 190 per cent. So we are not taking uh, for granted our commitment to our war against uh, drugs, and I uh, note that the, uh, the member's uh, uh, interest, long held interest in this particular area, but customs at the border control uh, have, with the new equipment, uh, been very successful to date in our border control area, together with the other enforcement agencies, in trying to stop drugs coming into this country. I might add today the seizures for uh, compressed cannabis amount to some 25 tonnes, for uh, cocaine 66 uh, kilograms and heroin to date this year 152 kilograms. The Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. What are the benefits of the government's policies for debt reduction and budget repair for young Australians in my electorate of Petrie? The Honourable Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Petrie for her question. Uh, as, the Deputy, as the Acting Prime Minister uh, has already indicated, this government's policies in relation to apprenticeships and traineeships in relation to the Green Corps have been very pro-young Australians. And the introduction of the youth allowance is but another measure to encourage young Australians and to give them incentive to go into education and to get the skills that they will need throughout their life. But, Mr Speaker, I want to place this in another economic context, and it's this. Nothing could be more anti the young people of Australia than the policy of deficit and debt of the Labor Party. The policy of deficit and debt of the Labor Party was a selfish policy. What it essentially said is that the Labor Party would use funds it didn't have today to try and buy votes and send the bill to the young Australians of tomorrow. And it's the policy of this government to rescue the young Australians of tomorrow from that crushing burden of Labor Party debt. Mr Speaker, in the five years from 1990, the Labor Party ran up cumulative deficits of $58 billion. $58 billion for a cumulative, cumulative loss of 50,000 jobs. A cumulative loss of 50,000 jobs over five years on nearly $60 billion of borrowed money. Mr Speaker, that borrowed money didn't just go away. That borrowed money has to be serviced year in, year out by the Australians of today, by the Australians of tomorrow, who will be paying taxes to fund Mr Beasley, the finance minister who presided over that economic malaise. As a result of his failure as a finance minister, generations of young Australians are going to be servicing the debts that the Keating Labor Party and the now Keating Labor opposition have visited on them. Mr Speaker, it is the policy of this government, first of all, to get government living within its means and during the course of the next financial year not to borrow not to borrow, but to repay Commonwealth debt. For the first time in a decade, the burden on future generations will be lessened in the forthcoming financial year as opposed to the Labor Party policy. Mr Speaker, these are the government's efforts, first of all, to balance the Australian accounts, secondly, to reduce interest rates, thirdly, to reduce government debt and fourthly, to give the young people in future Australia a go. Mr Speaker, Make no mistake, the Labor policy of deficit, debt, high interest rates was an anti-youth policy. An anti-youth policy. Mr Speaker, it was condemning future generations to a crushing burden of debt and taxation from which they would not have escaped had it not been this government's determination to turn it around. And I suppose, Mr Speaker, having created the problem, the Labor opposition then sat around and took every step they could to try and prevent the solution to the problem. They came in here, Mr Speaker. They voted against measure after measure. They were determined to inflict a continuing deficit and debt misery on future Australians. And the best thing that can be said, Mr Speaker, is that they were unsuccessful in their efforts. 
the Australian economy is back on track, the fiscal accounts will be balanced, debt will be repaid, and young people will be the great beneficiaries of that economic program. The honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Can he confirm that the Coalition's youth allowance will mean that 16- and 17-year-olds who have not finished Year 12 and who are not in full-time post-school education will get no income support and will have no access to labour market programs which might help them get a job? Isn't it a fact that these young Australians won't even be eligible to participate in the government's apology for a labour market program, the Work for the Dole scheme? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, the, the, the uh, youth allowance uh, is designed to provide uh, an incentive for young people, 16 and 17 year olds, to go back into school. We are not giving them the message <coughs> or, to, or to get accredited training. We, we, are, we are not going to oh, give them Dennis. the message that the Labor Party gave them that it is an acceptable alternative the to Minister, go the Minister, on the dole. Minister will resume his seat. The on the point of order, order, the question went to the people who had finished Year 12, not those who had yet to complete it. And I would ask you to direct the Minister to answer that yes, question. I'm listening very carefully to the answer. At this stage of the game, there is no point of order, Minister. <laughs> Members on my right. The, the question, as I heard it, Mr. Speaker, order. related to 16 and 17 year olds who are not in school. And, 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 and who, who, are, who, are, who are not in school. Uh, or in training. Or in training. Now, those, those, those young people, those young people, uh, if there is education or training available to them, will will, will not receive will not receive the dole, because the incentive is that they must go back and get the skills they need to get them jobs. If they are not receiving, if they are in receipt, if they are not receiving, if they are not receiving. If they are Remember not receiving uh, a full uh, allowance or benefit on youth allowance when they have left school, they are not eligible for work for the dole. They do have the opportunity, they do have the opportunity to access the, uh, the job search assistance that is provided by the government. All young people, all young people have that opportunity. But for the first time, and if, if they are are unable to access education or training because of exceptional circumstances such as sickness uh, or homelessness uh, or if there are traumatic job circumstances uh, or if there is no education or training available, uh, they, they, will be, they will be able to access the youth allowance but they will be required, they will be required to undertake uh, activity under an activity agreement. The point is that the dole, as a single, simple alternative to education or training, is no longer going to be available to those 16 or 17 year olds. The honourable member for order, the leader of the opposition. The honourable Thanks, member Mr. For Speaker. My question is addressed to the minister for primary industries and energy. Does Australia now enjoy the prospect of a new market for the export of live cattle into China, Minister? What actions are being taken to exploit this market opportunity for the benefit of cattle producers in my electorate of Herbert and across Australia? The Honourable Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Herbert, who has a real interest in this matter, for his question. He's a constant battler. Uh, in his quest uh, for uh, a better performance for Australia's uh, uh, meat industry and its exports. And, uh, I am very pleased indeed to be able to announce that after detailed negotiations with their Chinese counterparts, the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service officers in this country have successfully concluded a very important agreement on health conditions for the export of slaughter cattle to China. It's the beginnings of what will, I think, develop into a potentially 
very, very significant export trade. It effectively opens the door for large numbers of our cattle to enter the Chinese market. It should result in a major boost to trade. And I'm advised that the Chinese plan to, Im to uh, import 60,000 head each year for the first three years of the agreement, after which an expansion to 100,000 head per year is likely. And this represents a deal worth potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. Pressed beef, hard pressed beef producers from the southern areas of Australia will particularly benefit, but right across the nation there will be increased support for prices in a sector that at the moment is experiencing real difficulties. And Mr Speaker, as the trade builds, it will reinforce Chinese confidence in Australia's health status, potentially open direct opportunities for live cattle exports from other geographical areas as well, uh, and in, is in general terms very good news for uh, rural Australia. Last night, too, we signed a memorandum of understanding with China over anthrax designed to avoid disruption to trade in the event of disease outbreaks here. This is very important indeed. Uh, people have to have security in our capacity to handle these things. Both agreements, I should say, Mr Speaker, demonstrate the government's commitment to opening Asian markets to Australian agricultural products and keeping them open, uh, having opened them in the first place under the Prime Minister's Supermarket to Asia plan, and reinforced, if I may say so, Mr Speaker, very ably and in a very committed way, not only by the Minister for Trade but also by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Now, it should be made, the point should also be made that these exports are absolutely essential for jobs, especially where we really need jobs, and that's out in the regions uh, where unemployment has been very, very high indeed. And the point can also, I think, be usefully made that you know, we could, with perhaps just one out of three or four of our farmers, produce enough food and fibre for our domestic markets. All the other farm sector and the uh, industries and the employment in those industries that support the farm sector depend upon export markets for their livelihoods, for their jobs. And so the opportunities of the sort that I've just outlined give us a real chance not only to preserve jobs but to create new jobs in rural and regional Australia, especially for young people, given the very high levels of unemployment we inherited amongst young Australians from the previous administration. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Does the Minister recall telling the House that he was not involved in, quote, the daily work of any business, unquote, as set out in the Prime Minister's Code of Ministerial Conduct? Does he also recall on the 18th of May this year being asked about taxation reform on the Channel 9 small business program, and he replied, One thing I can say is that I still employ people myself. I see the forms that governments send through. I still see those sorts of things come through. Do you still stand by the answer you gave yesterday? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Mr Speaker, I comply with the Prime Minister's ministerial guidelines. The Honourable Member for Bradfield. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Could the Treasurer inform the House which, which section of the community is carrying the heaviest taxation burden? Does the structure of the current taxation system provide disincentives for work, productivity and employment? If so, how? The Honourable Treasurer. The uh, uh, Mr. Treasurer will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Court will unappoint order. Uh, the question he asked for an opinion and is out of order. No, the, the question is in order. I do not uphold it. Mr. Treasurer. <laughs> Treasurer. <laughs> Members on my right. <laughs> Treasurer. Uh, I, I thank the Honourable Member for Corwell for his interest and, uh, and I hope. Uh, that uh, I can, uh, I think I hope that I can answer the question to uh, to his satisfaction, Mr. Speaker. He was uh, he was my second year politics tutor at Monash University many years ago. I hope that, I hope the treasurer is not what? trying to damn with faint praise. Oh, no. <laughs> I owe him, a, Mr. Order. Mr. Order. Mr Speaker, I owe him a lot. Uh, he put me off left-wing politics for life. 
Or, uh, the subject was the morality of power, Mr. Speaker. Um, anyway, the member for Bradfield has asked me about uh, has asked me about the income tax system, and uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is true that the, uh, the Australian uh, taxation system uh, does not <coughs> equitably share the burden between uh, the various bases that uh, are used to collect tax in Australia. In Australia, by international standards, the indirect tax base is a narrow base and is a declining base. Conversely, the income tax base has borne more than its fair share in relation to the raising of revenue. Uh, in Australia. Australia's top marginal tax rate of 47 per cent cuts in at about one and a half times average earnings. And the second top marginal tax rate of 43 per cent is also very high and cuts in at a little over average earnings itself. Mr. Speaker, they are the marginal tax rates. Notwithstanding the relief given by the Coalition to families under the Family Tax Initiative, which of course was vigorously opposed by the Australian Labor Party. Uh, and uh, in particular by the member for uh, Werriwa, who interjects now uh, because he was, of course, opposed to the Family Tax Initiative and reducing the tax burden for families. <laughs> Mr Speaker, that means that uh, whilst Australia's top marginal tax rates are quite high by international standards, they cut in at very low multiples of average earnings. Part of the reason is, of course, Mr Speaker, that our indirect tax base is a declining tax base. The Australian indirect tax base is uh, principally focused on goods and in modern economies, of course. It is the services sector of those economies that is growing uh, the fastest and taking an increasing share of gross domestic product. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, you will often hear manufacturers in this country complain uh, that the indirect tax system features so heavily on goods. Uh, and because it features so heavily on goods, the indirect tax system is a special disadvantage for manufacturing industry, and obviously those uh, who have an interest in manufacturing uh, industry would support uh, a broadening in relation to the indirect tax system, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, one can't overlook uh, the difficulties in relation to the income tax system, and because of the way in which it impacts the incentives that there are to try and avoid the application of the income tax system and the level of advising and costs that go into avoiding the operation of the income tax system in Australia. It's important, Mr Speaker, for any government to constantly attend as well to closing down loopholes in relation to the income tax system and broaden the base of the income tax system in Australia. Uh, Mr Speaker, this government has a very proud record of achievement in relation to this. Uh, it was this government that closed down the R&D syndicates, which had closed down the R&D syndicates, which had become an absolute hemorrhage in relation to the income tax system. Mr Speaker, you'll hear the Leader of the Opposition interjecting because the Leader of the Opposition wanted to preserve R&D syndicates. He wanted to preserve R&D, a, a CJO that thought if they could offer a way of avoiding income tax that was being closed down by this government, they would go to those people who were using them and, in an effort to try and buy cheap votes, oppose the closing down of R&D syndicates. Mr. Speaker, and well may he turn his back at this point, a matter of shame by the Australian Labor Party, which was not prepared to support measures to widen the income tax base. Nor could we forget, Mr Speaker, it was the Australian Labor Party that was opposed to the superannuation surcharge. Great concern in the Australian Labor Party to income earners over $85,000, whose tax concession had changed from 33 per cent the, uh, under the Treasurer, ALP policy. Treasurer will resume his seat. The hon. Member for Newcastle the, the, the on a point, of a point of order. The question was about which groups and other disincentives. On May 26, you wrote to, there is no point on, on of May 26, there is, you wrote to us. There is no point you wrote of to us saying your the point. Mr. I'm allowed to make a point. You've, you've Can I made a make point of order point? on which I have ruled. Can I please make on it first? Can you've, I finish it first? You've, you've made the point. I haven't made it. You are debating the issue. I haven't, Resume Mr. Speaker. I'm not. Treasurer. What sort of a 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, and of course, one of the groups that bears the heaviest burden of income tax in Australia are PAYE, seat, are PAYE uh, taxpayers. You have taken on board, I hope, my comments about I have, points of order. You're, on you're, May 26, my point to you is, uh, on the point of order, is that you wrote to us saying, "I intend to require that a minister does not digress from the point of the question directed." The question from the point of the question was, directed, I'm, not the general issue. I listened very carefully to the question asked. I'm listening very, question, very uh, carefully to the response by the Treasurer, and it is completely within order. The Treasurer, the Honourable Member for Bradfield. Yeah, point of, point order. of order, Mr. Speaker. It, it was the, quest, the question was asked no, by me. There is no point. I want. I I've, want to I've ruled on this. The Treasurer will respond. Uh, and Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Member for Bradfield asked me about those sections of the community carrying the heaviest taxation burden, one of, one of the reasons why the PAYE taxpayer carries such a heavy burden of income tax was the amount of avenues that were open for high income earners to avoid their fair share. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons why the PAYE <laughs> taxpayer carries such a heavy burden. Now, what were, what were the chief mechanisms for high income earners to avoid their, to avoid their fair share of income taxation? R&D syndicates was a ripper. It was a ripper. It made, it, it, made, it made paying income tax quite voluntary. The superannuation surcharge for somebody over $85,000 gave you a 33 per cent tax concession if your salary sacrificed, and the Labor Party opposed reducing the tax concessionality. The Labor Party opposed it. Infrastructure borrowings, if you were over $135,000 of annual income, infrastructure borrowings made it voluntary to pay tax if you got into the right scheme. Who introduced it? The infrastructure borrowings were introduced by the Australian Labor Party, now crying crocodile tears as a result of this government's efforts to clean up the income tax system. Mr Speaker, this government has taken a very robust view to making sure that we protect the PAYE taxpayers and, again, CJO, cheap jack opportunism. The Australian Labor Party opposed those measures. Opposed those measures. The friends of the tax schemes, the Australian Labor Party, which opposed the measures. Now, as I said before, Mr Speaker, if you are looking at improving the Australian taxation system, of course it is important to widen the indirect tax base. But it is also important, Mr Speaker, to make sure that the income tax base is wide and is not easily avoidable. That is very much a part of this government's approach to taxation. Very much a part of this government's approach to taxation. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the only regret that we have is when we do do it, you cannot rely on the Australian Labor Party for any help whatsoever. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Order. I refer the Minister to his Bunbury Various Lots pecuniary interest return. Does the Minister have any franchisees as tenants in his shopping centres? If so, given he still has responsibility for implementing the recommendations of the Fair Trading Inquiry on franchising, and in particular, Recommendation 3.1. Is this a not another conflict of interest? If not, why not? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs will resume his seat. The Right Honourable Member for New England. Mr. On a point Speaker, of there is a problem in terms of our standing orders and the responsibilities of members of this place. I don't know how many members of the Labor Party worry about privacy, but I suggest to you that there are obligations within the standing orders Order. of this place. With the law passed regarding pecuniary declarations, and this question is out of order because it requires an answer of a member beyond his ministerial responsibilities and beyond the legislation. Order. Order. There is no, no point of order. Beyond the said. legislation, which requires a defined specification order. only is, of pecuniary interests, I no would suggest the, the question is out of order. There is no point of order. The minister. Mr uh, Speaker, um, my uh, register of uh, uh, members' interest is on the House of Representatives um, uh, register. On the second part of the question, the government will respond to the House of Representatives' inquiry in due course. The Honourable Member for Mitchell. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Administrative Services. And the I ask the Minister, order, can the Minister. I'll, I'll hear the point of order. Would you resume the Mr. Honourable Mr. Member for Cunningham point of order? Mr. Speaker, I go again to your um, uh, letter to each of us in this place about questions and responses from ministers. Quite clearly, the question that I put to the Minister asked about tenants and franchisees in his shopping centres that was not responded to. And, second, and secondly, it, uh, it went to the issue of conflict of interest because the Fair Trading Inquiry specifically makes recommendations I, I, about franchises. I'm listening very carefully to the Honourable Member for Cunningham. You, you are debating an issue without coming to a specific point of order. The Minister feels that he has completed his answer, and I have called the Honourable Member for Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members Mr. Speaker, my, my question right. is addressed order. to the Minister order. for Administrative Services. Can the Minister advise the, the House? Uh, Honourable Member for Mitchell begin uh, his question again. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister for Administrative Services, and I ask the Minister, can he advise the House why the government strongly supports a voluntary ballot to elect delegates to the Constitutional Convention? The Honourable Minister for yes. Administrative Services. We didn't ask you for your opinion. We're asking the Minister. The Member for O'Connor. <laughs> Mr Speaker, could I prefix my answer by extending my uh, congratulations to the Right Honourable Member for New England and the Member for Lawler on their appointment as the, uh, the Chairman of the Constitutional Convention. And may I say, Mr Speaker, that this convention is not to decide whether or not Australia is to become a republic, because that can only be done at a full referendum, which of course would require a compulsory attendance uh, ballot by all registered voters. And the vote is not compulsory because, unlike parliamentary elections, it's not about determining governments and the ballot will not confer any obligations or any particular powers. And frankly, we were not prepared to impose a law which would make Australians guilty of an offence if, if they chose not to vote uh, for delegates to this convention, particularly when a lot of Australians really have yet to come to grips with the complex and difficult issues in this particular debate. In developing the system, the government set out to design an election process which was fair and convenient and, importantly, it was to be cost-effective. We started from the proposition that the voting system should be broadly based on the Senate system, provide proportional representation, and that would be uh, uh, allowing the uh, independent groups and uh, individuals to have a fair chance of being represented there. Can I also say that the system will be similar to uh, the Senate process in as much as people will be able to vote above the line for uh, the particular groups uh, or the groups of independents or below the line if they want to go through the full preferential system. And quite frankly, contrary to the assertions of the ALP, the election is going to be open and accessible to all electors regardless of their background and experience. Mr Speaker, the government does remain firmly committed to a voluntary vote for the election of half the delegates to this convention. And we do want all Australians to vote. We will encourage them to do so, but we are not going to force them to participate. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I again refer my question to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Minister, is franchising part of your ministerial responsibilities? And if so, do you have any franchises in your shopping centres? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, Order. I will be handling the government's response. Order. I will be handling the government's response uh, to the Fair Trade Inquiry on the question of uh, franchising. The Honourable Member for Groom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice. Order. A member for Denison. Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. My question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I refer the Minister to reports coming out of Bali yesterday. A, trip a member for Burke. I'll start again, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is the minister aware of reports coming out of Bali yesterday attributed to a high-profile 
Indonesian businessman who contended that Indonesia does not need Australia in a geopolitical sense. Would the minister please indicate uh, to, to the House the importance for both countries of that bilateral relationship? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm happy to uh, happy to respond to the honourable member's question, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, remarks were made by one of the Indonesian participants at the conference yesterday of the Indonesia Australia Business Council um, to the effect that um, Australia needs Indonesia more than in Indonesia needs Australia. But as both the Indonesian ambassador. Um, uh, to Australia and the Australian ambassador to uh, Indonesia, as well as I said later on in the day, the fact is that both countries are of great importance to each other and are of mutual importance to each other. Indonesia is, uh, Australia is clearly important to Indonesia as a source of uh, technology, as a very important trading partner. It's uh, an important country to Indonesia. Uh, um, in uh, a whole range of very specific commodity areas, and uh, well, frankly, Mr. Speaker, I don't think there is any doubt that, uh, as was speak. pointed out yesterday, Australia is a country which is, in geopolitical terms, very There's important too much to Indonesia. On my left. Uh, we've given a very, um, uh, a very uh, heavy emphasis to a strong relationship between each other, between Australia and Indonesia, and uh, of course, the strength of that relationship simply reflects not only the geopolitical importance to Australia of Indonesia, but the other way around, the importance of Australia to Indonesia. That's well recognised by the Indonesians and it's well uh, recognised uh, both here in Australia. So, Mr Speaker, can I just take the opportunity to add that during the course of the, uh, during the, course of the meeting in Bali, I had the opportunity to discuss at some length the bilateral relationship between Australia and Indonesia with Co the coordinating minister for, Pro for production and distribution, Mr. Hartato, and uh, it was an opportunity for us to discuss issues in the trade area, such as uh, developing synergies between the Australian and Indonesian automotive industries. Um, I think there are very good opportunities to develop that relationship um, further than uh, is currently the case, and uh, I'm glad to say that um, uh, Mr Hartato responded very positively to uh, the representations I made in terms of developing a relationship between the Australian and Indonesian automotive industries. Um, so I think, Mr Speaker, um, that um, uh, the relationship with Indonesia in broad terms, in economic terms, in terms of uh, cooperation in the security field, um, in terms of education exchanges, which are growing all the time and quite dramatically, I think, uh, and of course, above all, at the political level, the relationship is one that uh, is extremely strong and one that both sides recognise, despite some differences from time to time and despite uh, difficulties from time to time, is one very much of mutual benefit. The honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Coles Meyer or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Minister. Affairs. The Minister will resume his seat. The honourable member for North Sydney on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I, ca I fail to see how that's related to the ministerial responsibility of the minister. It's a specific question about his personal interests and is unrelated to his ministerial responsibilities. I uphold the point of order. The question is out of order. The honourable member for Aston. Mr. Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, say no. no, no, right no. Right. Mr. Speaker, we have. Uh, right no. We'll give them. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House dissents from the Speaker's uh, ruling. Did you get, did you get that right? You'll do anything to protect him. Mr Speaker, there is no more important function performed by this chamber than it holds ministers accountable. 
That is absolutely the central feature of this question time process. Absolutely the central feature of this question time process. The question that was just asked of this minister goes to business relationships that he conducts at the point of time that he happens to be a minister. That is what the question was about. It dealt with the minister's uh, position as far as uh, his business involvements were concerned in relation to those three shopping centres, which he has manifestly, and I would say too, in breach of the standing orders of this place and the requirements of this place, manifestly refused or failed to place within his register of interests. And that's another matter that this House will have to deal with, I believe, at some point of time. But what is, uh, and perhaps it would have been a bit easier to deal with it now in, question to this, in regard to this dissent from your ruling, had there been an honest return from this minister in this statement of his interests uh, in this place. Because had there been an honest return from this minister, there could have been no question that this was front and centre within the rights of this House, members' rights in this House, to ask ministers, the minister question about, questions about his situation. Now, the guide or the code of conduct which every minister signs up to in this place, which uh, is honoured more in the breach these days than it is in the undertaking, but as the Prime Minister admitted, was a code of, a code of conduct which was effectively replicated while we were in office and for ministers subsequent prior to our, appoint, uh, our, our appointment to government, requires that, among other things, a minister shall not conduct the affairs of his businesses. Uh, when he happens to hold a ministerial position. Right. And it, is, it is not just a question of appearance, it is also a question of absolute propriety. But appearance is important in that regard as well. But when you go over from <coughs> simply the statement of whether or not those interests do exist to active promotion of business concerns as far as, the, uh, as, as far as the minister's portfolio is concerned, you are getting right at the heart, right at the heart of whether or not disinterested government is run in this country, whether or not disinterested government. How can it possibly not be relevant? How can it possibly not be relevant for the Minister for Small Business Affairs, who is conducting the, uh, an inquiry into both the situation of people with franchises and also the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people in tenancies and the po possibilities of oppressive conduct, who has answered an array of questions in this House on this, that place, who has referred those matters to a parliamentary committee, who has had a report on those matters, who is handling those matters for the government, and he had just responded earlier on, I might say, to a question on uh, uh, the c conduct in relation to franchisees, conduct in relation to franchisees, that he was still responsible for the development of government policy in that matter, even though in regard to the question of oppressive conduct in relation to tenants, he is, while he is developing the policy, evidently the Prime Minister, evidently the Prime Minister has removed uh, that particular uh, uh, authority from him. And uh, he now finds himself in a situation where he has a question directed to the heart of his propriety on this. Has he conducted with the West Australian Government indirectly or directly, in, uh, verbally or in writing, uh, a uh, lobbying or pressure or whatever on behalf of his business interests? Has he had any discussions with a director of the Colesmeyer Board in relation to uh, any of the, uh, uh, the tenancies uh, in in, uh, uh, for, his, uh, for his particular holdings? And you rule that matter out of order. Frankly, Mr Speaker, there is no logic in that ruling. None. If there is logic in that ruling, Mr Speaker, then this House cannot query ministers as the propriety of their That's conduct right. yeah, yeah. on anything. Yeah. On anything at all. And let me just go through because I because I had not had before me, not having for the for one minute, for one minute expected that I'd have to stand in this place and challenge a speaker's ruling on this matter. For one minute I didn't actually have the code of conduct with me. But let me, uh, let me read, this, uh, read this out. Ministers are required to resign directorships in uh, public companies and may retain directorships in private, com private companies only if such company operates, for example, a family farm, business or portfolio of, of, of investments, and if retention of the directorship is not likely to conflict with the minister's duty. Uh, ministers uh, 
uh, must uh, not accept retainers. Ministers must be honest in their dealings and must not mislead. Ministers are required to divest themselves of all shares and similar interests in any company or business involved in the area of their portfolio or responsibilities. The transfer of interest to a family member or to a nominee of trust is not acceptable. Uh, ministers should not exercise any influence obtained from their public office or use official information to obtain any improper benefit for themselves or another. I mean, it goes on and on. Ministers must, uh, should not accept any benefit where acceptance uh, uh, might give an appearance that they should be subject to improper inf influence. Uh, ministers are required to make statements of interest in accordance with the arrangements determined by the Prime Minister. The, uh, and, uh, and every single one of these has, in one way or another, Every single one of these has, in one way or another, been breached by this minister at some point of time in the course of the last year. It's what he's supposed to be and to come for. down to a position now where it is not possible to question this minister on the conduct of his portfolio and the relationship of the conduct of his portfolio to his private business interests denies any validity to the role of this parliament in holding accountable a minister both for his standards and for the conduct of his portfolio. Now, I never expected to get up and have to get up in this place and rule a dissent from your ruling, because I never expected that we would have a situation <coughs> here where you have upheld standards in this place and have tried your very best to uphold standards would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier. And uh, I do think, Mr Speaker, that you ought to think about this ruling very carefully. I don't know why you arrived at this conclusion, having, persist having permitted a whole series of questions which went to precisely this, what particular error in your hearing or whatever that there was in regard to what was put to you by, um, uh, by the member for Cunningham. But, uh, and I, I might read out one other of these particular standards, because this absolutely, absolutely goes to the heart of this. Ministers, this and subsequent references to ministers should be read as including parliamentary secretaries, must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. And I stress that, or in the daily work of any business the central guideline. They must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. Now, Mr Speaker, if the minister has had discussions in relation to tenancies in his shopping centres, if he has had discussions in relation to them, if he has approached directors who have in their control some capacity to determine whether or not somebody will take up a tenancy, if he has approached a state government with regard to any planning authorities that are associated with uh, his business activities, if he is handling on a routine basis employment issues that pass across his desk, and I remind you that earlier on a question was asked on that in which he in fact openly said that he is handling those employment, uh, uh, employment considerations, there can be simply no question, no question at all that what the minister is doing is engaging in the daily work of his business. What else is the daily work of a business of a person who owns shopping centres, other than the question of who tenants the place, uh, the terms and conditions in which those tenants go in, the terms and conditions laid down for the expansion or development of those places, the terms and conditions that are associated with the employees? What is daily work? What is daily work if that is not daily work associated with a business. And what does proprietorial standards mean in this place if there is no relationship between, or no capacity to identify a relationship between decisions being taken by a minister and the business practices of that minister? No, that daily activity, that daily activity I might, uh, 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 that I refer to, of course, uh, would preclude the minister from involvement no matter what his portfolio was. That is a prohibition not simply against a minister's role as a minister and what his business interests might be. So it would not be, if that were going on, it would not be required of us as an opposition 
to establish, in fact, a direct relationship between the two. It would not be required of us to do so. In this case, of course, we can. In this case, we can because the ministerial portfolio covers the sorts of business arrangements that he is directly engaged in his daily work. Were he to be the Treasurer, were he to be the Attorney General, were he to be the Minister for Defence, it would still be possible for us to question him in this regard, because this prohibition doesn't simply go to direct relationships to the minister's duties, it also it goes to the activities of a minister generally. But in this particular instance, it does go. So it is doubly culpable, culpable of a minister, doubly culpable of a minister, that he should confront this issue and that he should be asked to, and he should be capable of being questioned about it. And if you rule that out in this place, Mr. Speaker, uh, then, there is a, uh, then there is a deal of trouble for all of us. Now, the Prime Minister frequently defends his positions now in, in words that uh, I remember Charlie Court once saying that uh, he didn't want a minister to have the seat out of his pants. The Prime Minister says further it's a good thing for him to have uh, uh, ministers in this place who have had business interests and the experience. Member for Burke. I would not dispute that. I don't think it's a bad thing at all that members of this House should have had business experience. Uh, but there is a point of time when choices have to be made. When you become a minister, choices have to be made. You either make a decision that you are going to be able to uphold your ministerial duties to the highest standards that are imposed upon you, or you're going to do something else. These are issues that ministers have to con confront continually. Sometimes the appropriate response of a minister is to absent himself from cabinet if there's a clash, and a clash that is not likely to be regular. Sometimes there's a necessity to hand the responsibility for a particular portfolio's conduct over to another minister on a narrow area of, uh, of that minister's position. But sometimes it's necessary for a minister to make a choice and to decide that he will either divest himself or put himself at, at demonstrable arm's length from a particular activity, demonstrable arm's length, if he is going to be able to do his affairs appropriately. But one thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances, on, these, on a, reading, a proper reading of these particular uh, circumstances, one thing that minister cannot do under any circumstances at all, and this is not a question of standing aside from a particular decision every now and then. One thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances is engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. The daily work of any business. Now, I know, Mr Speaker, that you would have trouble discerning what the government's intentions are in regard to the operation of the Code of Conduct. And this would be, to some extent, mitigating you, uh, in your, uh, what we believe to be an incorrect ruling, because this government has absolutely no standards when it comes to enforcing its standards. This government has, uh, has, run, away, has run away from it repeatedly when questioned in this place, and it has to be said that the, these ministerial standards remain under review 15 months after this government has been appointed. We still do not have them finalised. But nevertheless, the Prime Minister made clear that why he, why he nevertheless, while they are nevertheless going down the road of, um, the, of uh, revising those ministerial standards, these ministerial standards would continue to apply. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, so they should. And I can recollect, Mr. Speaker, and I've actually had the numbers uh, asked of him. That when the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Keating, was on the other side of the chamber and in this place, he was subject to 14 questions in relation to his priggery from Hewson, McLaughlin, and all at those uh, at that particular point of time. Not one of them ruled out. Not one of those questions ruled out. And not and. The Prime Minister's defence was consistently, insofar as that piggery was concerned, is that he had absolutely no contact absolutely. with the day-to-day -day conduct of that exactly. business. No contact whatsoever question with the day-to-day -day conduct of that business. Qu and question after question was trying to establish whether or not he had. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with the New South Wales government. 
in terms of environmental processes that have been put in place. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with consumer affairs in relation to New South Wales on some other aspects of it. Questions were asked whether or not he had actually tried to influence local authorities in relation to the conduct of his piggery. You will recollect those, Mr Speaker, because you were in the chamber when those questions were asked, all of them, all of them asked directly to the Prime Minister at that, uh, at that point of time. Fourteen questions in all, not one ruled out. Fourteen questions. Now, what has been asked of the minister directly by the uh, member for Cunningham is simply this. Minister, have you had contact with a, uh, a director of Coles Meyer? Have you had contact with uh, any person in the West Australian government related to the conduct of your businesses in Bunbury? It's a simple, pro a simple question. A simple question that goes to the very heart of his personal accountability. Now, it has to be said. It has to be said that if you did not actually sit down and, uh, if you had had indeed sat down and worked your way through the uh, the particular propositions uh, that are related to his declaration, you could be excused from thinking that maybe this wasn't entirely relevant. But uh, by now, I think it should be entirely obvious to you that one of the most misleading documents currently circulating in the uh, chamber at the moment is the Register of Members' Interests, yeah. insofar as it affects uh, the conduct of this particular minister. Yeah, yeah. Where we have three shopping centres and I think also a petrol station, three shopping centres and a petrol station with 80 tenants in those shop shopping centres, as described as Bunbury dash various lots. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps it ought to have been a little more accurate if it had been Bunbury, comma, various, comma, lots, full stop. That might have been a more accurate description, but it would still oblige the minister to put those, uh, put those, questions, those positions down. Now, the common way in which this has been handled in the past, the common way in which this has been handled in the past has been for not the value of any particular shareholding to be uh, outlined, not the value of any particular property obtained or, or owned to be outlined, uh, nor necessarily its address, but an accurate description of what is owned. That is what has generally been required, and members conform. They usually say we have uh, a holiday home or a, uh, or a block of flats or, a, uh, or whatever it is. They don't put down Bunbury various lots for three shopping centres. An accurate rendition of this would have been three shopping centres. That would have been an accurate rendition and one petrol station would have been an accurate rendition probably, uh, insofar as we know it thus far, the, uh, of the members' interests. Uh, but uh, that has not appeared here. But the fact that it has not appeared here and therefore alerted you as a person who is a diligent student of these particular returns on, uh, on people's interests, as the Speaker must be, a diligent student as the Speaker must be, uh, you by now will have nevertheless have had it firmly revealed to you by us that there is inadequacies here and that there is a potential area of a conflict of interest. Enough of it. Enough of it for the Prime Minister at the beginning of this week to take responsibility off him. Off him. To take responsibility off him. The Prime Minister certainly now thinks this is relevant. That's why he took responsibility for one area of presentation to Cabinet off him and handed it to the Minister for Industry and uh, Tourism. Unfortunately, not much of it, just that part that deals with the Cabinet submission uh, process in Cabinet itself. The, de the development of those codes of conduct, however, remain within his hands and have been within his hands up until the beginning of this, uh, and indeed the presentation to Government, up until the beginning of, uh, of this week. And so anything that is historical in that regard is relevant as far as accountability is concerned. And a new front is opened up here now with its responsibilities in relation to franchising arrangements and the potentiality of particular franchisees, both at his petrol station and of course in his shopping centres, to uh, produce for him a conflict of interest in this regard. Mr Speaker, I conclude in this dissent motion, which I move with very great reluctance and considerable surprise. You must, as Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uphold the capacity of this House to query the government and the government's minister's handling of all aspects of their portfolios. You must, above all, permit this House to be able to query a minister about a clash between personal private interests and ministerial duties. This is the only place in which these queries can be made 
on behalf of the Australian people. The only place where confidence can be established for the Australian people is that they are impartially governed. If the opposition is denied it in this place, it will be a precedent. No opposition has been denied it by before, certainly not by us in 13 years in government, and you should act now to reverse your decision. Yes, the motion seconded. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I second the motion. Mr. Speaker, I have to admit, when uh, this question was actually put to you today, I was somewhat staggered when you ruled it out of order. And uh, perhaps I, along with the member, member for Watson and your good self, would probably be in a better position to know about these sorts of issues, not to forget, of course, a member for Flinders, because, quite frankly, uh, the question that was put here and the reason that we've uh, descended from your ruling did nothing more than endeavour to elicit questions and answers from the Minister for Small Business about issues which have been the subject of some discussion and concern in this place for a period of time now. And, uh, it struck me as somewhat odd that past history in this parliament, when your predecessors allowed questions on a variety of issues which the Leader of the Opposition has already referred to, that a question of this nature should be <coughs> ruled out. And as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, at uh, different times during the course of the last parliament, something like 14 questions Mr. Speaker, were allowed to the Prime Minister about his private interests in terms of the piggery, and it could well have been suggested then that it had nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities and ruled out. But the learned Speaker of the time allowed it to pass. And I'm sure those that are now in government thought it was a great idea at the time. And secondly, of course, we had examples of when the honourable member for Fremantle was under a degree of questioning in the last parliament. The same thing applied when questions were put to her about the Labor Party, nothing to do with her ministerial responsibilities, and again allowed to pass. So, Mr. Speaker, I have to say we find it rather strange that this particular ruling has been handed down. And we do so also, sir, for a number of other reasons. The first is that it has been clearly established, clearly established in this place that the Minister for Small Business has a conflict of interest when it comes to his ownership of property and his responsibility to develop small business policy on behalf of the government. Now, we have ascertained that that is the case from no other source than the fact that the Prime Minister has removed from his responsibility responding to the retail tenancy issues contained in the Fair Trading Committee report. He has been removed from that and John Moore, the Minister for Industry, given that responsibility. Now, we still haven't worked out when it happened because in question time on Monday the Minister and the Prime Minister in here were still saying that the Minister for Small Business had that responsibility. So by 3.30 that was still the go. By 7.30 that night on the 7.30 report, the Minister for Small Business owned up and said, oh, that's now gone to John Moore, the Minister for Industry. They've taken it off me because there's a conflict of interest. Well, interestingly, of course, Mr Speaker, and again one of the reasons why we've taken uh, exception to your ruling on the question that was put, is because another area of conflict of interest has been exposed to this minister, and that is in the question of franchises. Because if one looks at the fair trading inquiry again, you see in recommendations in section 3, particularly 3.1, dealing with franchising, it goes directly to his own personal interests. Because in his own shopping centres, there are franchisees that occupy positions there. Cash converters, uh, chicken treat and farmer jacks. Order. The honourable member for Cunningham will resume his seat. Uh, the minister Mr. on a point of order. Well, Mr. Speaker, I mean it is quite clear that on a motion which is to um, dissent from your ruling that the speakers must keep, you know, within sort of some parameters of that. Now we 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 were rema we rema I remained silent in the first presentation, which also which also order. which also strayed, Hoffman. but this. Uh, the honourable member for Cunningham is, is clearly well and truly beyond uh, the requirements of a motion of this sort in terms of relevance. I thank the, uh, the minister. The honourable member for Kalgoorlie on a further point of order. Mr. Speaker, it would seem to me that your ruling would. I, I'm, I'm seeking advice because it will influence how I vote. Had the opposition framed their question to ask, had he had any contact while he was a minister, 
it seemed to me it would have been ordered, but they didn't in fact do that. They asked at any time. Would that, would that actually influence your judgment? The simple answer is yes, uh, but there is no point of order. Uh, I call the. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, and I go to the simple fact to stay, in linking and encourage him to stay in linking me why we have dissented. Of the dissent why motion. we have dissented from your ruling in respect of that question is because you have allowed other questions that go to eliciting information from this minister, or at least attempting to elicit information from this minister about his dealings. And the simple fact is, when we put questions to him today about franchising and whether there were an existing franchisees in his own stores and his own shopping centres, he said, I'm complying with the guidelines. And we're dissenting from your view that further questions about franchising, about his private dealings in shopping centres, about whether he has been talking with representatives Coal Myers board or talking to planning ministers in Western Australia to get some advantage for his own business interests in Western Australia really means that you have, sir, taken the right option to rule questions of that nature out of order. And we would simply argue that's not the case. Now, the point that needs to be made again, Mr Speaker, is this. If this minister does not have any conflicts of interest and if you therefore have to subsequently rule further questions to him about his business dealings out of order, why then did the Prime Minister remove him from responsibility in retail tenancy issues? And, as a, as a logical extension of my question as to whether or not you will continue to permit questions to this minister on other issues, the fact that he does have this interest with, with, uh, with franchising again raises the question about who now, on behalf of the government, will respond to the Fair Trading Inquiry report in terms of those recommendations. And if, in fact, Mr. Speaker, this minister is removed, the question then goes. Who do we then continue to ask questions of in this place, given the Prime Minister is not here to give us some satisfactory answers? And it goes again to the fact, sir, whether you would rule out those sorts of questions if we address them to the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism as the Portfolio Minister and has now been given some responsibility, whether we address them to the absent Prime Minister, whether we address them to the acting Prime Minister, because I'm sure he would have an interest in this as well. But the simple fact is, if there was no problem, Mr. Speaker, about this minister and his pecuniary interest declarations and the Prime Minister's code of ministerial conduct, we would not have asked these questions. And we not, would not therefore be in this position where you have ruled one question asked by this side of the parliament out of order. Now, the Leader of the Opposition simply, again, went to some very fundamental but basic points in support as to why you should rever re reverse your ruling on this matter. He went, of course, to the minister's registration of members' interests and his real estate and, 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 and noting, as we've all seen before, Bunbury various lots. And if this minister is to be believed, if this minister is to be taken seriously by this place and by retail tenants and by retailers in Australia and their associations as being dispassionate, as being an advocate on their behalf, why did he not list in here that he was a landlord? Why is it that he's gone out three days after, Mr Speaker, this report was tabled and said in terms of franchising he doesn't agree with any of those recommendations and always wanted voluntary codes? Why is it that this minister in last year's budget cut the funding for the Franchising Code Council? Now, you could ask a few questions like that, just as retailers have been doing. And, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of these retailers in his own shopping centres have been doing that. They've been asking the questions. We're trying to ask the questions here, and you're knocking them out. One of the questions that one of his own uh, his retailers said uh, a Mrs. Oh, no, I better not identify, because you know he's a landlord. But uh, uh, he shouldn't be the federal minister for small business and such a major landlord. She was reported to say in the media. We have a number of franchises in our centre. I've named those, and I don't know how Jeff can be making decisions about what happens to franchises either. Well, Mr. Speaker, either do we. Either do we. And that's why we are putting questions that go to this minister's direct responsibilities. Now, the other matter, of course, links his hands-on 
daily work and his hands-on approach to his businesses while still being a Minister of the Crown. And the Prime Minister, in bringing down his ministerial guidelines, which, quite frankly, I think the Prime Minister set now so low in terms of the high jump bar that they're not even worth worrying about, these ministers walk through Order, them the as if they don't the exist. The member for Cunningham will resume his seat. The, uh, the, for the process of dissent to your ruling relates to the standing orders, not the prime ministerial edict on any matter whatsoever. And it is, it is incumbent on those speaking to the dissent motion to do so pointing out where your ruling has failed the standing orders. And I would draw your attention to 142, where it says questions must be, may be put to a minister relating to public affairs. But I would ask that uh, you ask the member to get think, back to uh, the standing the orders. The Honourable Member for uh, O'Connor, I have uh, encouraged the Honourable Member for Cunningham to address the specifics of the dissent motion. <laughs> Absolutely, I Mr Speaker. I, I, will intend to, I, I intend to do just that. And as I said to you earlier, Mr Speaker, we have, a, we have a right and a duty in this place to put questions to ministers about their responsibility. We have a right and a duty on behalf of constituents around this country to say to ministers, do you have conflicts of interest? If you do, what does that mean in terms of the Prime Minister's guidelines for, for ministers? And it means nothing. And if we can't put questions in this place, for fear that they are going to be ruled out of order by yourself, then we are indeed in a great deal of trouble. And, Mr Speaker, we've all seen the editorial in The Australian today where it concludes that this minister should go because there is a conflict of interest. And we have said that. We have established that. And retailers around this country are saying just that. They want us, on their behalf, to put questions to this minister about his dealings on a daily basis. Does he see the tax forms come into his companies? Do those people that are managers of his shopping centres, does that impact on our ability to ask him questions about whether that conflicts with the Prime Minister's code of conduct? And they do. They do. His manager of one of his shopping centres, Colin over there, is reported as having to say, well, you know, I have to go and have a chat to Jeff occasionally to find out what we should do. Now, is that part of the Prime Minister's guidelines for being divorced? in a day-to-day -day, day -day basis in looking after shopping centres. And what about the West Australian Retailers Federation Mr. Mr. Uh, Association, Mr Speaker? They want questions asked because what they've said in a letter to the Prime Minister is that given you've already demonstrated your leadership in issues of conflict of interest, integrity and probity, in particular that of the banking vested interest, we so no, see no reason why Minister Prosser should not be treated similarly to his colleague Mr Short. Well, dead right. Mr Short's going to Europe to a banking job. Maybe the Minister for Small Business has to go back to Bunbury to put a full hands-on approach to his own business interests. But, Mr Speaker, the questions that we wish to put in this place and which we wish to put on retail tenancy issues, on the questions of franchising, on the questions of the Minister's hands-on day-to-day dealings with his business interests, in the questions of whether or not there has been in, uh, in some way an approach by this minister now or at some stage when he's had responsibility for small business about each and every one of his shopping centre developments, whether in the past or proposed. We would like to be able to do that without fear, sir, of you saying to this side of the place they are out of order. And we would ask you to go back and look at, uh, at, look at the Balin book and look at some past history there to get the historic hansards, look at what was allowed by your predecessors in terms of prime ministers and their, their activities. Look, sir, what happened in the Senate in respect of some senators when they were asked questions about distant related cousins in faraway islands of the South Pacific and whether or not that was ministerial responsibility at the time and whether those sorts of questions were allowed. Of course they were. But when it's this side of the parliament, when it's the Labor Party asking questions about ministers who have dealings on a day-to-day -day basis, when there is a clear conflict of interest, Mr Speaker, inexplicably, they seem to be ruled out of order. Now, why is this so? We would say to you, sir, it is incumbent upon you, having listened to the argument for the Leader of the Opposition and myself, to reverse your ruling, allow that question to stand, allow the Minister for Small Business and Customs and Consumer Affairs to come to the dispatch box and to tell us once again how he hasn't breached the Prime Minister's guidelines, 
how he should remain in control of responding to the Fair Trading Inquiry report and why the retailers of Australia should have every confidence in him as a landlord that he'll do the right thing by them. We wait for the answer, Minister. We look forward to that answer, Minister. Here is your opportunity. Don't fob it off to the Leader of the House. Don't fob it off to him. Come to the dispatch box, answer those questions and tell the people out there that you represent that you'll do the right thing by them. The question information be agreed to the Leader of the House. Order. Order. Mr Speaker, the, uh, uh, the government will oppose Order. the— The member for Watson. Mr Speaker, the, the government opposes the uh, dissent motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, the Opposition, quite frankly, they were too quick. Uh, they were too impatient. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, can I remind honourable members? Can I remind honourable members that the question, which is the subject of the dissent motion, was not the first question to the minister today. In fact, it was the fifth question. The fifth question to this minister today. Uh, there was a question from one of the independent members. Uh, he was. Uh, the question was put to him. He answered it. Uh, there were. There were then. There were then three questions. There were then three the questions, Mr. Banks. Speaker, which were put to the uh, member, which were generally on the subject matter, uh, which uh, is now in the dispute. For uh, he answered each and every one of those questions. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the right honourable member for New England, in fact, rose on a point of order on a claim that one of those questions was out of order, and you ruled the question in order, and you required the minister to answer it. Now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a very technical issue. This is a very technical issue. The question is whether or not the question that was asked was in fact within the uh, requirements of the standing orders. And before I answer that in that in detail, the simple facts are, Mr. Speaker, the simple facts are this: uh, from a practical point of view, you, roll, you ruled the question out of order. If the if the question had then been uh, the opportunity to ask a question that would then have gone to the government, and then it would have been the opposition's turn, and they then could have asked a question which was within order. So this claim, this claim that you know this uh, ruling of yours has prevented them asking questions of the minister is clearly false. One, he's been asked three questions which he answered, and furthermore, he would have he would have been answering further questions on this very issue if only. If only, Mr. Speaker, if only those on the other side, with all the experience of sitting in your seat and running tactics on the other side, had only been smart enough to understand, as the member for Kalgoorlie pointed out to them in his, uh, uh, in his uh, engaging question to you, as the point he made it to you was, well, if the question had been properly drafted, would you have allowed it to have been asked? And the answer obviously is. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, so they were just too quick, too the quick. And as, as uh, I've seen the leader of the opposition make many presentations, I'd have to say today's was one of those rather more lacklustre presentations, which is which betrays that he doesn't have his heart in it. Because as a former leader of the House, he well knows that on any fair reading of the standing orders, Mr. Speaker, the ruling that you gave Remember was entirely, entirely consistent with many previous rulings by uh, uh, speakers in this House. Well, no, I will answer the question. I will answer that question in some, uh, in some detail. But let me, let me just, uh, before I go to the technical arguments, say, Mr. Speaker, you acted fairly, you acted properly. And furthermore, you acted consistently yeah, yeah. during question time, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, it, is, uh, it says a lot about this opposition. They don't even understand how to use the standing orders to run an attack on a government minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, my uh, uh, understanding of the question is now it's interesting that neither of the two speakers on the other side actually stood up in the house and repeated the question. Didn't repeat the question. And in fact, I read over. I read. I, I led over the. I led over the uh, bar table during the uh, debate, and I said, "Would you bar table?" And I said, 
would you give me a oh. copy of the question? Would you give me a copy of the question? Oh no, we're not going to give you a copy of the question. And I'll tell you why you wouldn't want to give us a copy of the question, and that is because when you read it, it's so obvious how so out of order it was. This is the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with— No, no. no. Oh, now this, I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. You know, they, as soon as I start to read out the question, it's immediately obvious to them now that it left out a couple of words, so they're trying to put them in by interjection. I mean, talk about CJO, CJO. Now, I will read it out. I will read it out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Colesmire or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments? in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? That was the question. Now, why is that uh, question uh, clearly defective and, therefore, why is your ruling uh, clearly uh, should, why should it be supported by the House? Well, firstly, Mr Speaker, the first and obvious thing to say about this question is uh, that uh, it is not an issue, it does not raise an issue of whether the minister can be asked questions about conflict of interest. In other words, it doesn't go to conflict of interest per se on the face of the question. It, no, no, you left the words out. Listen, you know, your tactics committee is going to have to sort of get up earlier and think a bit harder about its questions. Uh, you left that out. The second thing is that, that, that you made no, apart from, the, apart from the fact that you referred to the minister, you know, minister, this is the question for you, apart from that, there was no nexus with the minister's ministerial duties. No nexus with, on the face of the question, as, as, a, as clearly on the face of the question, no direct nexus, no nexus with the minister's duties whatsoever. In fact, in fact, Mr. Speaker, not only was there no direct reference, when you look at the last words of the question, in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest, in fact, those words qualify the question and limit it to personal business matters only. In other words, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities. Now, Mr Speaker, what are the rules? Those are the facts. Those are the facts. What are the rules? Well, the rules on this, the rules on this are very, very clear. If, you, if I direct members to House of Reps Practice, uh, page 509 on questions, this is what it says. The underlying principle is that ministers are required to answer questions only on matters for which they are responsible to the parliament. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, a number of examples are given, statements, actions or decisions of the minister's own party or of its conferences or officials or of those of other parties, including opposition parties. Well, it's not that one. Um, statements by people outside the House, including other members, notably opposition members. No, not that one. Not that one. No. Um, statements in the House by other members. No, not that one. No, it's, it's all the practice the barracking for, for the bombers, and we're getting yeah, a bit hoarse right. in the throat this year. Right. Uh, but you know, I tell you, and how did the bombers go against North Melbourne? That's a very good question. Now, as a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, that's a question that would be in order, provided it was properly, uh, you know, nexus to the minister's uh, ministerial responsibilities. Uh, then uh, the other one is, and this is uh, just to. Uh, keep people's attention on the issue. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, anything of— I'll, I'll read it slowly for you, Simon. I'll read it slowly, slowly and clearly. Anything of a private nature that is not related to the public duties of a minister. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, I had an interjection before which said, oh, you know, has anybody ever made such a ruling before? For heaven's sakes, read the House of Reps practice. It's there in black and white. There in black and white. You had no nexus, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities, and the question, and the question was clearly to the financial for, personal thanks. interest of the minister. Uh, let me say, uh, go on and say, because this is an interesting little point that uh, comes up in the House of Reps practice. They say, as mentioned in the cases above, it is not in order for the personal conduct or private affairs of a minister to be criticised by way of a question. A charge of a personal nature can only be raised by way of a direct and substantive motion. This fundamental parliamentary rule was reiterated by Speaker Snedden, and he then goes on to give the quote. Now, I'd say there's another sort of clue in this about the tactics, you see, because 
We had a number of questions on this issue yesterday, and we sit here on the front bench and we're saying we get notes from our colleagues saying, you know, what's going to happen next? Are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? And, and what was clear at the end of question time yesterday that they didn't have enough for a censure motion. So we got no censure motion. What we got today was in the tactics meeting. Now you see, so admission, admission, admission out of your tactics committee. No, nothing, nothing to run for a censure motion. And then today they pick up the papers, they see the Australian editorial, and they say, "Oh, Whippy, we'll give it another run." Do they run a censure motion? Oh no, oh no. In fact, they, they must. I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say that in their tactics meeting this morning, the view would have been that it's quite clear that they didn't have enough to run on a censure. The opportunity was provided today, an excuse used. You didn't have anything for a censure motion. So what do you think you do? You're going to run an attack on the speaker. Run an attack on the speaker on the basis of a, of a ruling which has, is as clear, as clear a ruling within the standing orders as I have ever seen in the whole time that I've been in this parliament. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, the fact of the matter is there is no substantive motion. The fact of the matter is that if you hadn't been so uh, uh, impatient, you would have been able to ask that question to the minister if you had properly worded it. I mean, that is the position. That is the position. The member for Kalgoorlie, what an embarrassment he's been to you over the years. But what an acute embarrassment he was when he today asked the speaker a question on a uh, basically on a point of order which had said, "Well, if the question had been properly drafted, Mr. Speaker, would you have allowed?" The questions to have been asked and therefore required it to be answered. And what did you say, Mr. Speaker? Perhaps uh, uh, not uh, in any way attempting to uh, involve you in this debate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that would be improper to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, knowing you well, uh, knowing you well, in your response, uh, the, uh, the sense of uh, accommodation you are prepared to afford the member for Kalgoorlie makes it quite clear, Mr Speaker, you actually do know about what the standing orders mean when it comes to questions of this sort. And, uh, Mr Speaker, you had no hesitation in ruling the question out of order. You had been considering the issues because the right honourable member for New England had put the issue to you quite uh, squarely in the previous question. Uh, you had clearly had it in your mind that this was an issue that you might have to address during question time today. I thought, I thought in respect, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, without canvassing uh, your views, but I did think that it was an option for you in response to the member for New England to in fact say, well, part of the question was in order and part of it was out of order. But you, in your wisdom, Mr Speaker, you said, no, the question was fair enough. We accepted that. We accepted that ruling. We accepted that ruling. Uh, that, was, uh, that was in the hurly-burly, Mr Speaker, of, uh, uh, of the House. You have discretion. You have a discretion in the uh, handling of these matters. You exercised the discretion in what you believed was a manner fair and consistent with the standing orders and reasonable in all the circumstances for the, matter to have, uh, for the House to have these matters properly before it. Uh, so on that matter, Mr Speaker, we accepted your ruling. There was, I wasn't up on my feet saying, oh, you know, the second part's out of order. You ought to support the member for New England. None of this nonsense. Why wasn't I? Because the minister was more than happy to answer the question. He's got nothing to hide. No, no, he's, got, he's, been, he's, he's, complied, he's complied with the ministerial uh, uh, requirements. He's, uh, he's complied with the requirements of disclosure. We've had a lot of talk about this uh, disclosure of the ministers, uh, which says apparently I haven't even read the thing, but what does it say? Bunbury, uh, various lots. That's in his own personal name. And the, the other allegation is, is that he didn't list certain properties, but those properties were held by the company. There's no requirement for him to go into the assets of the company of which he is a proprietor. And I tell you what, if there was, we would have had the piggery. We would have had the piggery. Every last little piglet would have been on the disclosure form. Uh, was that the requirement then? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. So old CJO is putting up a new form of, of, of pecuniary interest declaration, which of course he wants now but never wanted when the piglets were in charge. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we, re we reject this. Well, we reject this uh, on uh, we reject this on a very uh, uh, substantial basis, and that is, this is a motion to dissent from your ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker. We don't like all of your rulings. Let me say we don't like them all, and we would be dishonest if we said anything otherwise. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, if I couldn't say that, then you wouldn't be an independent speaker. Uh, 
Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, you exercise your discretion. Uh, you do so in conformity with the standing orders and on an independent basis. And you've done so, you've done so today. You've done so today. And as I've just, as I've shown, Mr. Speaker, as a matter of logic, as a matter of precedent, as a matter of common sense, as a matter of consistency, in every possible way. The ruling that you gave, Mr Speaker, uh, was entirely a correct order. On that basis, uh, we have no hesitation in rejecting this motion of dissent, and we reject, we reject the, the, this opposition that has used this motion as a means to attack one of, uh, one of, an excellent minister, a person who has done a first-class job Order. as the Minister the for Small Business. The Honourable time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Mr Honourable Speaker, I support the dispense motion because what you have ruled out as Speaker, you allowed in as whip. The question is that the motion be put. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No, it's have it. Division? Division required. Ring the bell. You got, a, you got about a minute.
Order. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. The ayes will move to the right of the chamber, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Carragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the ayes and the honourable members for Fowler, Meribanong and Bruce for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 86, noes 43. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler. Time, okay. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler, Meribinong and Bruce for the ayes, the honourable members for Caragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 43, noes 87. The resolution is therefore resolved in the negative. Would members quickly and quietly resume their places or remove themselves from the chamber forthwith? The Ask the further questions to be placed on the notice oh, paper. The, the, I think the Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs wishes to add to an answer. Yes, Would Mr. Members quickly resume their seats or remove themselves from the chamber. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Yesterday, the member for Kalgoorlie asked me a series of questions concerning the recent arrival in the Torres Strait of a vessel with 139 people aboard and I undertook to provide further information when I was in a position to do so. I can now advise the honourable member that the group uh, has told my department that they are from China's Fujian province and that the steel hulled boat left China on the 18th of May this year. Departmental records indicate that this is indeed the largest single group of unauthorised arrivals to reach Australia for at least the last 10 years or so. And, uh, the second largest arrival was a group of 118 Sino-Vietnamese from China who arrived in Darwin in November 1994. All of the 139 people have now been flown to the Port Hedland Detention Centre where the facilities enable, uh, enable that group to be properly dealt with. That transport cost sorry, $337 and I do acknowledge that that's a very significant amount of money. $337,000. Thank you. Um, the, initial, the, initial, for Watson. the initial interviews have, have been conducted. Their claims and their motives for travelling to Australia and any possible connections are still being investigated. And I'd add that uh, we have to assess uh, their claims uh, in a bona fide way and, uh, and ensure that they're heard and we don't prejudge them. And regardless of the circumstances of their, their <laughs> arrival, the law requires proper procedures to be followed. And of course, this is being done, and I will report further to the House when my department's investigations are completed. The Honourable Member for Chifley with a question. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I have a question to you. <coughs> May I have your permission to circulate your answer to my question about a clipping service? And further to your answer, what is the cost of producing the House of Reps media clipping service? Who is it distributed to and in what capacity do they receive it? What would be the additional cost and time of producing sufficient copies so that each member of the House might also receive a copy? I thank the honourable member for Chifley for his question. I will take uh, the balance of your question on notice and until I resolve that question, the answer about circulation of my former answer uh, we will put on hold. The Honourable Member for Hunter with a question to me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The House of Representatives Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology recently re released its Fair Trading Inquiry report. I hope to copy parts of the report and distribute them among chambers of commerce in my electorate. But when I contacted the Committee Secretariat, I was a, for a copy of, uh, for an electronic copy of the document. I was advised that if carried out, my intentions would uh, constitute a breach of copyright. Can you seek advice as to whether this hurdle can be overcome, so that members in this place can properly disseminate that very important information into their local communities? I thank the honourable member for Hunter for his uh, question, uh, which I think is a very good one. Uh, I will take it on notice and uh, report to you or the House later. The Honourable Member for Newcastle. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to you which you may respond to subsequently. And I refer to your letter of the 26th of May and I quote from that when you say, I intend to require that a minister does not unduly digress from the point of the question directed to him or her, nor should the response be un unreasonably long. It seems to me in recent weeks what you've been saying is that the question, for example, was about taxation the minister is answering about taxation. In other words, you seem to have been interpreting it in the broadness of the question, not the point of the question. I would ask you if you would, would examine 
those interpretations over the last fortnight in the light of that letter, <coughs> because, because I'm certainly not, uh, not certain. Uh, and what, what one goes then further to the points of order you raised further well, on. I, th I they, think they the, then become uh, very relevant. the honourable member for Newcastle, I know you have a, a continuing deep interest in these matters. As I said on a number of occasions, the, uh, the new guidelines are taking some little time to uh, bed down. I think the bedding down process is now uh, reasonably successful, but I'll take your question on notice and I'll talk to you about it privately. The, uh, I have one report from the...